All right, folks, let's still come up just a little bit closer. We can have a nice, uh, you know, more intimate conversation instead of the, the standard tap dances that we all do. Um, and to pick up the thread from here, uh, Commissioner Joe Briggs from Cascade County, Montana. Well, thank you for hanging in with us on this last day of the conference. I'm going to take a little different tact on this. I think it's important to, to maybe put this in a little bit of a context. Um, obviously, the, the slides that I presented don't interface with the, the issues that we're going to have to change with the stand up at the clearinghouse. Dave and I have had some long conversations uh, this week to figure out exactly what we're going to need to do to adjust how we operate. So what I'm going to give you is a, is a picture of what we develop locally and kind of a background on why we felt we had to develop it locally. The, uh, I think the first thing that, that's important is that both sides understand where we're coming from. And from the standpoint of, of local government, why we care about renewable in, uh, energy and, and any economic development and military missions, we'll kind of talk about in these next couple slides. I mean, the military missions are important to local communities because they mean jobs for local civilians. Um, in some areas of the country, myself included, Montana is not really known for being very culturally diverse. Uh, we're kind of like a white sheet of paper, and uh, uh, we have Native American components, obviously, but uh, culturally and, and ethnic backgrounds, we're all pretty similar. So the military presence that we have in, in Great Falls really enhances the, the cultural diversity of the area and is a tremendous asset to us in that respect. They provide a uh, steady source of new talents in the area, uh, both from the standpoint of active service members. We get a lot of folks, we, we pride ourselves on the fact we have a lot of Air Force folks that come back to retire at Malmstrom because they like the lifestyle, they love Montana, and, uh, and they are, are really important to our community. Of course, we have the children and we have the military spouses. Um, local business in, in Cascade County would be paralyzed without the, the military spouses, quite frankly. They are a, a huge set of well-trained uh, folks that we utilize within our, our, our industry. Um, hosting a military mission is a large source of pride for us in Great Falls. The mission brings a lot of outside dollars into the communities, which is obviously important. And the men and women of, of the missions are an integral part of the community. Uh, we work very hard on this. These literally, the folks at Malmstrom are not only a, a lot of our blood donors, they're our, our uh, mentors in the, the Big Sisters and Big Brothers program. They're my Boy Scout leaders. Um, you know, just throughout the whole community, they are, they are an, an integral portion of it. And they bring the average age down of our community quite a bit, too, uh, which is also helpful. And their absence would really be missed. In short, they, their whole presence uh, creates additional economic opportunities and, and uh, opportunities of, of cultural diversity and all those types of things for all of our citizens. And of course, most importantly, every day they're working to keep us free. Um, on the other hand, the renewable energy, some of these are the same. They mean jobs for the local civilians. And from the standpoint of a, of a local county commissioner, this next one is critical. Uh, they create a tax base that is low cost for the local jurisdiction. And by that I mean, when you look at, at development like residential housing, it costs you more in services than what you derive in tax dollars. So when you talk to economic development officials and you talk to county officials, and you're talking about, well, I'm going to bring 1,500 new houses in. That's why we don't get really excited, because it costs us more than it generates. Now, I have never seen a windmill cr commit a crime. So, I mean, you put those things in, they, you get large amounts of taxes off of them, and you don't require any service. Uh, so from a standpoint of tax base, renewable energy projects are tremendous. They're just, there's no impact other than uh, issues with the military that we that we seek to avoid on the front end, and they provide a, a good tax revenue. Once again, their presence creates additional economic opportunities for all of our citizens. As we've added additional wind farms around our area, the local Votechnical College has, has created a new program to teach people how to maintain these systems, so there's additional educational opportunities. Renewable energy is an important part of our energy independence for our nation, and I think that that increasingly people are understanding that that's an important element of national defense in and of itself. Where we get our energy 
is important for the long-term uh, stability of this nation and how we have to respond from a defense standpoint. And like I said, they create new vocational opportunities for our citizens. But, and this is the huge but, if you do them wrong, they can damage the long-term viability of existing missions and preclude future missions. And that last one, of course, is the tough one because none of us know what future missions look like. But from a, a county standpoint, it's something that we try to deal with. So the, so the overall challenge is, uh, is going to vary from mission to mission. It's going to vary from state to state. But the fundamentals, in my opinion, are always the same. Uh, you want to encourage development without conflict, and you do that by early detection and deconfliction of potential interference with the military assets. And once again, this is how we operate now. When there wasn't any sort of a national clearinghouse, there wasn't a, a good intercept point to find out about what was going on. The earlier that you can address the problem in the planning process, the easier and less expensive the solution. It's no different than having to change course with an aircraft or, or a vessel. Uh, the further out you can change the course to avoid an obstacle, the less of a course correction is required. The closer you get, the harder you've got to pull it over. We've discovered that most renewable energy projects are not specifically location sensitive. So the location is if it's a problem for the military, it's not generally a problem for the developer to move something. And uh, by that I mean they look at things in fairly broad ranges, especially the wind energy, energy people. They'll put up a series of anemometers and they'll make assumptions about <coughs> specific wind conditions between those anemometers. So if you identify something that's a problem, they can move it before they've got started to turn dirt. Uh, it's not really an issue to them. It, it, it's just not that site specific. The last minute objections by the military, however, just lead to the lawsuits and endanger both the existing mission and the energy project. So from our standpoint, the key to the solution is always communication, early and often. <clears throat> so as you step back, I mean, communications, it's easy to sit here and, and say that we need to communicate. It's not as easy as it sounds on, on paper. And while some of these are funny, uh, they're actually real. Uh, from the developer's standpoint, my project's outside the, bench, uh, outside the base fence. I don't need to talk to the military. Time is money. You're slowing me down. Get out of the way. What do you mean I can't build it there? I own it. It's my land. Uh, if you don't want me to, th and this one is so common, if you don't want me to build it here, buy me out. Um, and the last one that we hear from developers is I have the required permits from the state and the county. Leave me alone. Uh, I should also have probably added into that the FAA because we've had some issues where the FAA has cleared things that we didn't even know about locally and the local base didn't know about. Now from the base planner's perspective, the traditional view is it's outside the fence, not my problem. If they build it and it becomes a problem, we'll just stop them. Uh, you know, I mean, we're the military. We win all the fights. How dare they do something? I've got nuclear assets. You know, I mean mess with me, I'll turn you to dust. It's that kind of a deal. Uh, play the national defense card, always works. They wouldn't even have those property rights if we weren't out there defending them every day. And can you say eminent domain? So those are kind of the responses that we got from the traditional base planner view. So just a little bit about Malmstrom and why this became an issue for local government at the level it did. Malmstrom Air Force Base is not your typical base. Malmstrom is the home of the 341st Missile Squadron, the first and the best missile wing in the world. Now, Monday I had some folks that were here from uh, F.E. Warren that took a little offense to this, but I told them, you know, sometimes the truth hurts. Um, <laughs> the, the operations area of Malmstrom yeah, is 221 distinct secured military compounds scattered over 23,500 square miles. Federal government does not own the land between these sites. It's all private land. In fact, the federal government does not even own a lot of the places where the missiles are. They simply purchased easements. They don't actually own the underlying dirt. These 221 compounds are interconnected by over 24,000 miles of pressurized cable vaults, as well as a radio and microwave communication system. All the sites are accessed by both vehicles, uh, 
via the county road systems and military helicopters. The missile field spans nine different counties and uh, it also spans much of the highest weighted, rated wind resources in the nation, hence the issue of wind developers versus missile field. Uh, some additional things. State of Montana, and a gentleman was asking me a question earlier. I know it, it varies from state to state. If you come from one of the more populated states, or you come from a state like Florida that has paid a lot of attention to the military, uh, you'll probably be surprised to find out that a lot of the states, in particular the western states, there is no accommodation for the military as far as zoning goes, and zoning typically doesn't even exist outside of major cities. Montana is one of those. Uh, Montana, up until this last session when I got a bill passed, had no military zoning statutes, and the issues with Malmstrom were really viewed as a local problem rather than a statewide concern. Uh, the uh, eight of the nine missile counties have no permitting system for buildings other than state-required post-construction electrical permits. And what I mean by that is in the state of Montana, outside of a city or the one county which is mine that has zoning, all you have to do when you build something is call the state inspector to come in after the fact and inspect that the plumbing and the electrical was done correctly. So there is no process by which somebody who wants to build a wind farm inherently has to go to the state or the local jurisdiction. Um, that's just not in the game, that's just not in the cards. Zoning really is a four-letter word in Montana. I am still, quite frankly, surprised that we were able to institute zoning. That's something that, I've been in office about six years. We got zoning in um, my second year in office. So it's, it's a new thing uh, for us even. There also didn't, there wasn't a formal organization for the nine, nine counties that covered the missile field. Uh, we knew each other through the statewide organization of MACO, the, the Montana Association of County Officials, but there was no meeting group, no working group of the various counties that shared the issues of the missile field. <clears throat> and although the community of Great Falls has long worked diligently to have a, a great relationship with Malmstrom, the other counties were kind of outside of that effort. They have, they have the missiles out there, they don't have the base. And so not only was it from the standpoint of the, the military people that the base was in Cascade County and therefore that's where the focus was, the other counties kind of felt the same way. They didn't really have an understanding of the economic impacts to them. They didn't understand the importance of the missile field to them. Um, and that, that created definitely some problems. So setting out how to establish the communications, Rather than recreating the wheel and, and starting something entirely new, I looked at what relationships did we already have between the civilians and the military leadership and between the counties. And we have a very aggressive military affairs committee of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we have a, what's called a co-commander system. I know some bases have, some don't, where we literally pair a downtown couple with um, the officers at the base and they meet as a whole group once a month uh, for large functions, but in between those, the community partners, the community co-commanders are tasked with inviting out the base uh, officer that they're assigned to and their spouse into the community, you know, take them to baseball games, take them to dinner, um, just make sure that they are integrated into the community. And that has been a tremendous asset for us. We have an organization called the Central Montana Defense Alliance, which is only about a year and a half, two years old, um, that is our lobbying wing that handles the things that, that the local governments can't do and the base certainly can't do. And we've tasked them with part of the mission of getting the data to the other counties of the importance of the military to them, rather than these big numbers that, that the military will generate that talks about their economic impact we've been able to break it down more for what each individual county gets out of it. Uh, in the terms of the missile fields, that's such things as the Federal Highways Administration rebuilds the roads that the missiles are actually hauled on because they have a very specific set of, of uh, specifications for the, for the missile haulers. And that's, that's big bucks. 
So we've isolated that down, and we've also looked at where the uh, where Malmstrom does its its uh, contracting, and we've identified in each county contractors that are, are uh, major uh, recipients of of work at Malmstrom, and that's helped. And then the other thing we found that we we were really kind of surprised about, and never thought about it, is uh, the single biggest customers for the rural electric co-ops that serves those counties is Malmstrom Air Force Base because of the power needs of the actual missile silos themselves. So we've taken all that information and, uh, and gone out to the counties to, to basically it let them understand a little better the importance to them, to their local jurisdiction, of having the missiles. And we also have the Montana Association of County Officials I mentioned we were all members of. So we've used those three uh, organizations and the other existing relationships to create some more lasting processes and organizations. Out of that is our, came our joint land use study. So our policy coordinating committee, which is generally elected officials in most areas, uh, contains representatives from each of those other counties because obviously the recommendations of the JLUS are going to have to be adopted by each county at the implementation stage. So rather than craft a document and then hand it to them and say, here's what we want you to pass, uh, we've been very careful to make sure that we've got their buy-in throughout the process by including them on this in the system. Um, one other thing I guess I would point out about these counties, because I know that for those of you who come from more densely populated regions, this really is a little different world. Most of these counties do not even have a planning department. Uh, they contract with other counties for planning services as necessary. And the only reason they have subdivision regulations is because there's a state law that says they have to. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the mindset in these rural areas, and uh, that's actually where the missiles are. I mean, the missiles, the reason that, that Montana was chosen years ago for the first missile man, or Minuteman uh, flight of missiles is because there's not a lot out there. You can go a long way and not see people, and that's exactly what was required and is still required for that mission is the lack of, of population density is a positive thing. And the other thing that we did is we actually created a formal organization within the Montana County's uh, organization called the, uh, the Missile County Coalition. So we now meet routinely with the other commissioners from the, uh, the other missile counties on these kind of issues. <clears throat> you also got to make sure that both the civilian and the military planners are educated into the importance of this and the process. Uh, and the civilian and military leaders must require their planners to be co-op cooperative and collaborative problem solvers, not roadblocks. It's really easy for either side to decide they don't want to deal with it. Um, I think that's especially problematic on the military side because at least in the Air Force, if we keep a base commander for two years, that's a long time. So when you've got this constant turnover at the higher levels of, of command, uh, it's pretty easy for the planning department to drift. So we've put a lot of effort into connecting on a personal level and on a social level our planners with the base planners so that there is more than the official connection, there's also the unofficial connections. And we've used that to create an automatic interface between the base planners and the county planners. So you've got to identify points early in the process where you can have the military weigh in. Uh, and you've got to formalize a method to resolve conflicts early in the process. What we've done since we have countywide zoning and there is a process by which they've got to come to us for, for windmills or anything else for a land use permit, we automatically require them to go to the base first. Uh, if a wind developer comes in and wants to meet with our planning department, our guys sit down, they go through the county rules, and then they say, but you have to go to Molstrom. You have to get their sign off before we'll take it to the planning board. Um, we had a, an issue with a developer not too long ago that took, took some umbrance at that. He says, I've got my FAA permits. You can't tell me that. My planning director said, um, yeah, the county commission can tell you that, but if you'd like to talk to the commissioners, go ahead. So he, yeah, but he says, I'm going to warn you. He said, you talk to Briggs, the first thing he's going to say is, where's your letter from Malmstrom? So this developer comes in armed for bear, and he's telling me all this wonderful stuff, you know, all the economic advantages that this is going to have. And I said, you know, that's really great. Where's your letter from Malmstrom? And he just looked at me and said, 
you can't do that. I said, yeah, we can. Um, because like John said, uh, counties have a lot of discretion. Uh, in most, your, most states, you just have to show that you considered things and that you have a rational reason for your decisions. You don't typically get second guessed on the decision itself, just the process you used. So that's how we've done it. Um, and that's worked extremely well. The, uh, the only trick to it was to get the planners at the base to actually start making comments because for so long they had basically been told you don't make comments. Um, and when they first started making comments on projects near the base, it was, I was getting comments from them from their Gmail accounts because they didn't want to call and they didn't want to send it on their official email. So at night they would email me their unofficial comments uh, off their Gmail accounts. So there's, and that's why I say there's got to be some education and, and obviously with, with the, uh, the new stand-up uh, that Dave is running, we've got to figure out exactly how that fits in so that the, the local base planners can continue to comment without being concerned about crossing the line the Congress set about objecting. So, you know, we've got some tuning we're going to have to do on ours too. Uh, from an ongoing standpoint, <coughs> civilian leadership has to be willing to enforce through land use policies and tax policies non-encroachment. And the reason I bring the tax policies up is, like I said, not all jurisdictions have land use controls. But in a lot of states, there are tax abatements that a local jurisdiction can grant. And this is what we're proposing to the other eight counties that, that don't want to have zoning, is that they condition whether they grant the tax abatement to a wind generator as to whether they've gotten clearance from Malmstrom. So there are still ways to, to even without the land use, you have to be a little more creative, but you can still channel that information to make sure that it gets to your base planners. In Montana, we've got uh, a tax abatement that lets you cut new and expanding industries uh, or renewable energy industries taxes by 50% for five years and then it clocks back up by 10% a year. So that's a 10 year span of reduced taxes. They want that. And that is a huge carrot that you can use. And I've always been big on carrots instead of sticks. Okay. That's property tax abatement. Yep. And Montana doesn't have an income tax. So, so it's heavily, ba our, our, everybody's funding is heavily based on property taxes. I'm sorry, we don't have a sales tax. We have an income tax. God, I wish we didn't have an income tax. But um, we have an income tax. Uh, but no sales tax. So the property taxes on commercial development tend to be hefty. So the, the carrot that we have uh, on that is quite large. The other thing that counties have is counties have the ability in Montana to assess an impact fee of up to one half of one percent of the total cost of the development on wind energy or other renewables. That also is a big chunk of change. And so counties can use that as a carrot, too, to basically encourage the kind of behavior that will not be disruptive to the military. The key thing in all this, though, goes back to communications. If the military can't give me an assessment of where the problems are going to be, I'm kind of out of, you know, I'm, I'm just swinging in the wind. I can't really do anything because I don't know uh, the intricacies of the missile field. I know a lot more about it than most civilians do because of the constant interface I have with them. But that's definitely not my business and I don't have the security clearances to make it my business. So um, that communications is important. The military, and, and the other thing, the military leaders ha have to recognize that they have to be reasonable <coughs> um, and the value that the renewable energy has to everybody. A uh, good example, when we first started the JLUS and now give you just a little bit more background. You've got these 221 facilities scattered out in this 23,500 square miles. Around each missile silo there is a fenced compound with a Doppler radar. The Doppler radar takes a picture about every two minutes and compares it with the previous picture. And changes in that picture represent a inside the fence security alert. Scattered throughout the missile field with each 10 missiles, and we have 150 active silos, with, 
Each of those uh, is controlled by a MAF unit, a missile alert facility that controls 10 missiles. So there's 15 MAFs. The MAFs also have security personnel at them. And they basically are cruising out all, all day and all night. They're just cruising around the missile field um, like a patrol car would in, in your local jurisdiction. But when they get one of these alerts, depending upon the nature of the alert, they will always uh, send one of the roving patrols out to the missile silo. They may dispatch the static patrol from the MAF, and they may also call in an air unit uh, from the base. Now, the air unit, these guys look like the Rambo movie. I mean, they, they waddle on board the, the helicopter with the bandoliers of all sorts of nasty good stuff. And, um, you know, they, they really are loaded for bear, and they, they, they don't take no for an answer when they show up. That's their job. They're protecting nuclear assets from terrorists. That's the whole deal. So these choppers take off from Malmstrom at high speed, and they go out point to point. I know from operations they don't fly from Oscar 1 to Oscar 7. You know, they fly from Malmstrom to Oscar 7 to respond, and then they go back to Malmstrom generally. But the first time we met out and met with the ops chief for the helicopters, I said, I need some corridor data from you so that we can make sure that it's included in our JLU study so we keep windmills out of that corridor. I need you to, to tell me what are your flight routes. We don't have flight routes. We fly everywhere, point to point, whenever we want, wherever we want. And I said, so you're claiming airspace of 23,500 miles? Yep. I said, nope. So the military's got to be reasonable about this, too, because you can't take a size, a, an area. And to put it in context, 23,500 square miles is West Virginia. That's my missile field. If you take West Virginia, that's the size of it. So you can't just decide you're not going to allow anybody to do anything on their own private land over that area. Um, we've gotten past that, uh, but that was, that was the initial response from the base. Yeah. I mean, we could have guessed at them, but I really thought we should give them the courtesy of, of uh, telling us, you know. Uh, and there were a couple of things that we were a little surprised about. But, um, and, you know, and especially with surety of nuclear weapons, they have some reasons to be pretty, pretty hedgy about things. Like the, the 23,000 miles of, of underground cable vaults, we cannot get a map of that, and we're not allowed a map of that. It's all public information in the sense that um, they're marked out in the field, and a guy could go out and GPS them, but they will not provide an actual overlay of that information. Um, Don't want to make it easy for the bad guys. Well, and like I said, I understand that. Um, but it does make it kind of interesting when you're trying to do the J-loose and do some of these other things. <coughs> and uh, you've got on an ongoing basis, you've got to make sure that your legislation in place at the state level and your regulations are reviewed to make sure that you're protecting the changing mission requirements. Um, a good example of that is when, when the missile field was originally established, it was Minuteman 1 missiles. It's now Minuteman 3. The booster sections are about 110, I'm told, percent more powerful than the original boosters, but the safety zones were never in, enhanced over all of these years. They've been in the ground since 1962. Uh, Air Force has never, never expanded the safety zones. So the safety zone for e explosion of one of the, the solid boosters uh, is now inadequate to the reality of what's in the, what's in the tube. Um, and you've got to co constantly cultivate the relationships between the civilian and military leaders uh, so that the processes that we put in place remain in place. And that's especially uh, important because of the turnover that you get in the military personnel. So you also want to make sure you anchor it into the civilian side of the planners. Because the planners are the continuity, at least in the Air Force. They're going to be there throughout the process, whereas the commanding officers will come and go. So let me just give you two uh, true case studies of, of what has happened in Cascade County. Um, one of them in Cascade County, one of them in another county. Wind developer, now wind developers don't tend to broadcast that they're buying up wind assets, at least not in Montana. They do this, this very quietly. Uh, they go out and they buy options on, on the land. Uh, and so we had a situation, a major wind developer is in town. He's quietly purchased all the options on the land for the wind towers. Uh, this was the one that really bothered, whoop, that was the wrong button. I 
Gotcha. I'm back. I just said where I'm going. Need to go. Thought that was the pointer. I pushed too low. Sorry about that. Oh, now I'm too far. Okay. Um, this was the developer that came in and said, I've already got my FAA approval. Well, why do I have to talk to the base? County knew nothing about it. Uh, Malmstrom knew nothing about it. He had come to the county planning office to get his required conformance permits. Um, and as I told you, we require that to go through Malmstrom. And in that process, Malmstrom went through and it reviewed all of its tower sites. They found one tower that would need to be moved because it was going to block uh, one of the microwave signals that, that interconnect the, uh, uh, the MAF with, the, with one of the silos. Um, our planners and the Malmstrom planners worked with the developer to find a different site that would work just as well for them. And the developer got his permits, no additional costs, no delay. Uh, Malmstrom was able to preserve a, com a critical part of their communication path. There was no conflict. Things calmed right out. Once the developer understood he had to go see Malmstrom, ran through the process. Afterwards, he actually thanked me for ha making him go to see Malmstrom um, because it saved him a lot of hassle and a lot of money. Win-win um, situation. Our processes made sure that the communications occurred early. We got the problem resolved early, no fault, no foul. The other one, uh, the not so happy case study, was in one of the neighboring counties. Um, in the 50s and 60s, when the Air Force bought these easements from local farmers, they did not get them recorded on the property deeds. And so you can do a title search on some of these properties and the easement will not show. Now the Mal Malmstrom's got a full record of all of them and uh, if they get challenged they can produce those in court but with them not on the deeds that's a real serious problem. There's now a new generation of farmers working the land around the silos, and not all of them are aware that Malmstrom owns 1,200 feet from the center point of that missile silo. I mean, they own the easements for development. Uh, one particular case, uh, the farmer signed an easement with a cellular provider, and they put a tower within the 1,200-foot easement. <clears throat> that county doesn't have any sort of location conform from conformance permit because they don't have zoning, so this tower was only limited by the after-the-fact inspection of the electrical by the state. Uh, literally, one of those helicopter loads responding to an internal security alarm at a, at a site goes tearing out there at night and pops up over a hill and suddenly there's a cell tower that wasn't there the week before. Um, good news is the pilot was able to evade it, but bad news we got this completed cell tower in the safety zone. The landowner is in trouble with the cell company because he sold him something he didn't legally have the right to sell. Cell company's mad because they had built something where they couldn't build it. Uh, the safety of the security team was compromised. And the only people happy, the attorneys. Now, I have a lot of friends who are attorneys, but I work really hard to try to not keep them in business. But uh, so that's two case studies, one involving the, the correct communication of engagement early and the other one where we're kind of like Dave was talking about the, the old deal where the FAA only had to, you only had to notify the FAA 30 days before you put up a tower. So um, that's the end of my uh, actual presentation. Anybody, yes, ma'am. There is now a discussion of exactly that question going on at Malmstrom. Uh, and once again, I mean, that's their business, but it's not like the silos are invisible. In fact, I bet you that if you went up and Googled it, you could probably find the location of every silo and, a, and an overhead uh, aerial photo of it. But We're running into the exact same thing um, on a security review of the soon-to-be-rolled-out Clearinghouse website. Um, DOD's willingness and what we are allowed to release in terms of DOD land records and actual borders, stuff that's available in thousands of public locations and stuff that you can see on Google Earth, we can't put it on an official DOD website. And there's an eternal uh, tension between um, people who believe 
that you never make it easy for any kind of bad guy and you never put out anything and people who believe that transparency uh, especially when it's available in a thousand other places is the way to go but the the stovepipe um, folks will win a little bit on our website so I can only put on a DOD website the stuff that is uh, you know, a subset of the stuff that is publicly available in terms of hey these are the kind of MTRs and special use airspaces and things it's it's kind of crazy but them's the rules even to the extent like when you do a cable locate in Montana uh, when you call the, the master number for a cable locate they route everything through Malmstrom uh, to find out if that's anything that's going to disrupt. But they won't give the map to the, the clearinghouse entity that does the does the uh, locate, but they do at least ask Malmstrom. Um, yes, sir. Who ends up uh, putting the bid? Land owners, military, cell on the cell tower. Uh, actually, the military was, I thought, remarkably kind. Uh, the negotiated settlement was the cell company has five years to get the tower out. Uh, as I said, I thought it was remarkably kind, and, and they marked it on their flight maps to avoid it. But uh, it really is a, a good uh, case study in the sense of what happens when people aren't talking. And that makes sense, but no, I think I think the uh, the earliest signed documentation wins, whether it was filed or not. The problem with it not being filed is, of course, there's so many systems that that feed off of that, all of your title searches and everything else. So, and unfortunately, that was the tip of the iceberg. We're discovering that there's a lot of property owners out in the missile field. When we sent them out letters, because we got. Um, we got names and addresses of, of all the, the property owners that the Air Force had and the parcel numbers. We don't know exactly where the easements are, but we got the parcel numbers. And we sent out, oh God, it was in the neighborhood of like 700 letters to landowners because there's, a, there's an Air Force easement across their land that the county sent out as part of the JLUS to make sure that, that they understood what was going on. Uh, we got a, a frightening number of letters back saying, what do you mean there's an easement on my land? Uh, so it's, yeah, that was that was a tip of the iceberg uh, pointer for us, that there's a real problem out there. All right. Well, we uh, talked about land solutions and negotiated solutions, and um, Bill Van Houten was in this game. Uh, some of y'all may have seen his name on a little thing called the DOD BLM Wind Protocol. He was negotiating how to figure out um, you know, how to overcome the conflicts a couple of years before I got into this. And we keep trying to move some things around in uh, installations and environment. Hopefully within a couple of weeks he's going to be not only in reality, which he has been acting as for almost a year, um, but uh, on paper as well, the deputy executive director of the clearinghouse. He um, has been deeply engaged with a lot of the R&D efforts. Um, they're, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy pulled together um, kind of a review of the literature to figure out everything that might be possible in the next two to five or ten years in terms of wind radar mitigations. Um, and he's going to keep uh, the R&D chunk in his portfolio. So he'll uh, give you a peek into all this. I'm going to step out for just a second for a quick phone call, and I'll be back. Um, so I can say anything. You can say now. anything you want, but you see the red dot on the camera? Uh oh. So I will find out. Okay, ladies and gents, Bill Van Houten. Um, I'd like to thank you diehards for uh, persevering through this, and you're going to be rewarded now with my hour and a half of uh, excruciating detail of what we're doing in R&D or maybe I'll give you the alternative which is about a 20 minute overview and you can ask you can ask questions. Um, a lot of this I think has already been uh, covered in some of the other presentations so I'll, I'll just quickly skip over. 
some of it, obviously. Um, the, the problem um, with a lot of these renewable energy sources is that while everybody's very excited about them and it's great to be green and, and clearly there's a national imperative to develop them from a, from a national security perspective, nobody thought about the unintended consequences, which are their impact on radar, um, especially, and, and the, other, the other major impact is that uh, because of their height, you've got an obstruction impact. And the only process that was in place to deal with any of this is the FAA's OEAAA process, which is their obstruction evaluation um, process, at least on the national level. Now, on some of the state levels, we actually do have some protections, and then some states even go another step further, like the state of Oregon, where I believe if um, if they if the developer does not get a clearance through the OEAAA process, basically he can't build the project, but that's not true in most states where actually even if he gets clearance under the OEAAA process, it's inconvenient to build the project, but basically you know, he can still build it so long as he can manage to get financing and insurance and convince people that even though the FAA has made a determination that there could be a problem with the project, um, he could conceivably m move forward. And, and the poster child is an example of where that's happened is the stratosphere tower in Las Vegas, where actually that was turned down, but it was built anyway. So even as we're going through all this, we, we still have problems which are going to have to overcome um, legislatively. Dave talked about the, the uh, National Defense Authorization Act provision. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one thing he didn't, he didn't mention is that the standard in there is an unacceptable risk to national security, which is why we are, um, through our process, we're going to have the, the Deputy Secretary of Defense as the final um, say on whether or not we recommend to FAA to find um, an issue with a particular project. And we've already talked about the third point. Um, on this, I think uh, what I really want to cover is the third bullet on, on this. So we're hoping that through research and development, we can do away with some of the, the issues um, we have currently have with renewable energy development. Uh, right now, um, I mean, I, I got to say this is still fledgling. We're working both within DOD and interagency um, on solutions, and we're looking at solutions both in terms of improved modeling tools, which would also, which would be good for us internally in terms of being able to turn things around more quickly, but also in terms of doing public outreach. Because developers are always asking us for a rough cut as to where they can and cannot build. And actually, what Kern County did with the red, yellow, green map was a terrific first first step in this. But we're going to, there's a lot of pressure to, to come up with like the next generation uh, screening tool for this and right now our screening tools don't go much beyond if you're building something in line of sight of the radar um, we've got a problem and it, it, we're gonna have to improve that the other piece is improving um, our radar systems which are both surveillance radars things like long long-range radars on our on our coast to see what's what's coming in as well as internal to the country and navigational radars and um, so we're hoping, we're actually hoping that through this we can decrease um, the list of projects which can be uh, ultimately approved um, at the end of the process. We've already, as Dave, as, as Dave uh, stated earlier, we had 249 projects in the backlog and we cleared 229. Well, that still leaves us with 20 where we're going to start working on mitigation solutions and, and R&D is going to be part of the way to do it because right now we need tools in the toolbox in order to really run those mitigation um, discussions. And I got to say that for some time now, developers have actually been coming to us and saying, well, you know, can we build something? Can we give you something? Can we, is there some way, is there some way out of this monetarily? And part of our problem is that because the research really hasn't caught up with all of this yet. We can't give them a definitive answer. So one of the things we're working on right now is validating systems that are already out there um, so that we could actually say, yes, if you build us an X radar um, in, in, at point Y, we can, we can actually um, work around the problems. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, just as a, as a quick primer on this, there are, are a couple problems with the, that the radars experience, and, and basically what they come down to is 
wind turbines, because the blade tips on, on wind turbines are close to 200 miles an hour, so they look like something, like it, an aircraft of some sort actually moving, and they basically fool the radar. So you get, and this, this is through the Doppler effect, which I'm not going to get into, but basically it produces false targets, and you can have targets which are actually there which are, are hidden, either because they're physically hidden from the radar or because what our radars do is actually they step down their sensitivity to try to avoid the spinning things that they see out there and they finally reach the point where they're not seeing things which are actually there. So we, we both lose things which are there and we get things thrown up which aren't there, which is obviously a bit of a problem. Um, and I'll just say our research and development effort is part of a 270 day uh, comprehensive strategy which is in the legislation, the, um, that NDAA legislation. We have been actually working on this for some time, but our first true milestone now for, for going back and reporting to the Congress is about another three months out where we're going we're, we're to be uh, reporting to them on feasible and affordable long-range mitigation options. Um, now, this was helped to some extent because for the last nine months or so, we've been working through a White House group um, and through the Office of Science and Technology Policy on a, on a on a, on a report as to what the various options are. And that's what I'm going to get into in just a moment. So um, what we have to report, and these are the sub-pieces that we have to report back to the Congress on our, provi our, pr uh, our priorities for research and development dollars. Um, another area we can look at is modification to military options. So we can look at, at things like, well, you know, we can, we can change where we're flying or times we're flying, things like that. Or we can also um, it's also been suggested that, let's say, you've got something out by a testing range. You could actually work some kind of an agreement with the wind developer where the wind developer will shut the wind farm down for a certain number of hours so that we can run our test in a, in a pristine environment and then, and then bring it back up. But I'll also say on the, the long-range radar side, we've had a couple of developers come to us and suggested, well, if we see something from afar coming in and we want to get a better look, maybe we could push a button and shut the turbines down for a period of time to get a better look. Although I will say on, on that score, the difficulty is that the, the, the operators are actually concerned about pushing a button, shutting, shutting the turbines down, bringing them back up, and then be told, well, you did that for no reason and you cost us X dollars and, and we, we want some kind of a recovery on it. So maybe that's not a perfect solution in that particular instance. Um, we're looking at recommended uh, upgrades or modifications to existing um, DOD systems, acquisition of new systems, and, and, and then modifications of projects. And I'll say one of the things that really helps us in all of this is that in many ways the Congress actually helped us with the legislation. We actually were having discussions with the Congress for some time before um, they actually passed it. We were involved with, with this right from, from the start and in fact um, urged them not to give us the initial draft of this actually had us with with veto authority over wind farm development developments, and we didn't actually want that much authority. We believe the FAA should be the ultimate regulator on this. Um, but one of the th another way they really helped us with through this legislation is that we can accept funds from developers um, in order to. Uh, mitigate impact from their wind farms and in a way this makes sense because it's basically the concept in, in like an environmental law where the polluter pays. Basically we had an environment where we could operate before the wind farm went up therefore the wind farm developers should be responsible um, for, for uh, it, f mitigating the impacts of his wind farm on our system. The Department of well, the clearinghouse will negotiate this through the through the um, the mitigation process. However, I mean the Defense Department will collect the money. I mean the money isn't you know necessarily going to go to the to the clearinghouse. Does that answer your question? No. Well, we haven't done this yet, but I would say probably. Um, you know, I'm not so sure that it necessarily has to go down to that level. I mean, for instance, let's say, let's say the ultimate solution is to um, build an additional radar. Um, I don't know why that money would necessarily go down to the unit to build that additional radar. Um, 
before moving on to the specific, uh, the, the stuff we're really looking at, I thought I'd just hit a couple points that are on, on this slide. Um, one thing we're also looking at in terms of modeling is how we might change the config, work with the developer to change the configuration of his wind farms. I mean, this is already going on to a degree. Um, it goes on with micrositing right up to the, to the very end of, of a wind farm um, um, being cited in its, in its finality. And we're looking at ways of perhaps um, reconfiguring turbines so that they're less of a problem for our radars. And I mean, to some extent, for instance, you can have terrain mask, um, you know, where, where a turbine isn't taken out of line of sight. Um, stealth blade technology is something that folks will, will frequently bring up at uh, forums such as this. We're rather skeptical of it working. It's, it's fairly expensive up front, it's expensive to maintain, and it's not clear how well um, that will really work. And we're, we're really looking at other solution sets which we think are probably going to be more fruitful, especially in the, the shorter run. I will say that there is a company over in the UK that is actively pursuing this and will be interested in what they, they might come up with. But right now it's not something we're looking at um, seriously. And just on the, the model side, I'll just add something because um, I don't think I've got a future slide on this. Um, we've been working with the Department of Homeland Security on improved modeling systems. Homeland Security issued a, a contract a couple months ago. It'll take them about two years to bring this to completion. And what they're looking at is currently we have two-dimensional models to model the impact of the, the radars and what we're, uh, the impact of the turbines on our radars. The DHS model will give us a 3D look at it, which should greatly um, improve our ability to determine impact. And I already dealt with uh, the curtailment issue and relocation I haven't dealt with, but obviously this is a problem too because if our standard is unacceptable risk to military mission, um, there's always going to be this tension that, well, maybe you can't do this particular, you know, operation at this site, but you might be able to do it over here. So there's going to have to be, uh, we're going to have to look at this from a, from a cost perspective and whether or not we can, in fact, do some missions in alternative locations. And I'll just say from this slide, the thing I would pull out, cumulative impact I think came up in certainly one of my discussions in this room. One of the, one of the biggest problems we've got is that we've actually had locations such as Shepherd's Flat, which Dave dis uh, briefly discussed, where DOD has actually approved multiple wind farms. In fact, at Shepherd's Flat, we had approved, I think there were already thousands of wind turbines approved, but the problem is when, when you added the additional several hundred wind turbines to the turbines which had already been uh, approved, it got us to the point where it took us over the edge in terms of what we could and could not see. So we've got a challenge in terms of communicating with developers as to exactly um, where the, what the straw is that, that finally breaks the camel's back. Now luckily at Shepherd's Flat, we then came up with um, a solution set that, so that they could build um, the particular wind farm and push this problem out, you know, even further. But it does illustrate the problem that you have areas that look like they're perfectly acceptable for development, but you're liable to reach a point where due to cumulative impact, you cannot take another wind farm in that particular location. Um, the White House report I alluded to earlier is this wind farm impact on radar system assessment of mitigation options. Um, you can see DOD, DOE, NOAA, uh, DOI, I mean, there, there were multiple contributors to this, um, and, it, and it set up what I'm now going to discuss, which is everything was uh, possible solutions were put into buckets of short-term, medium-term, and long-run um, solution sets. Some of the short-run solutions we've already actually demonstrated. Um, obviously, one of the first short-run fixes is a replacement of um, an existing radar, but that, of course, assumes that there's um, there's a, a system which which is right there which will already work. Obviously, if the if from the from the beginning, if you get buy-in from the developer and the developer pays X dollars for this, the the cost of it could actually be spread out under under um, utility rates, so the cost can be can be recovered. So DOD can be made whole and the developer can be made whole. So actually, it's it's win-win. Um, one of the one of the things we're actually doing right now is an adaptive clutter map, and I think Dave may have mentioned this. 
during his talk, and basically what it does is it, is it tells the radar to ignore certain areas of what it is seeing so that it doesn't get confused by the turbines. And the downside to it is, is that you don't want those areas to be too large because basically they, they amount to blind spots. So in developing these systems, you try to make the areas as small as they can be. And the beauty of these systems is that they can also be integrated with a system which already exists. And so basically it's just an, it's an adjunct to it and, it and it can be done fairly rapidly. Um, the solution for the Shepard's flat radar is actually um, still going through testing and then ultimately approval. It has to be approved by the FAA because the FAA actually owns the radars in the end, like the, lo the long range radars such as what's at Shepard's flat. And so they have to approve whatever solution comes out of it, but it's certainly promising um, technology. Um, another thing we're working on is sensor fusion, and basically Travis Air Force Base, um, there's a future slide on this. There was a, uh, Travis is a, is a major um, hub for cargo aircraft in coming in and out of the Pacific. Um, the radar there was blocked by a wind turbine field. But the solution that was developed, and it was developed through multiple partners, and you know, uh, a lot of good discussion was to take two already existing radars that were also in the area and fusing the data feeds from the three of them to so that a complete picture could be could be had, even though the the radar that was at Travis itself was blocked. Now I'll also say this worked this worked particularly well in this area because. Um, there was a lot of fiber optic in the area, and it was, and, and it was, it was, you were able to build these together. But part of the solution here, and what we need to be continuing to work on, is improvements in being able to fuse that data real time to get a picture up on a screen right away. Next area we're looking at is gap filler radars. And so this is a situation, unlike Travis, where you'd actually have to build an additional radar that isn't already there in order to fill in um, the gaps. Now, luckily, they can be, they can be um, smaller radars with specific radar, with specific waveforms that will get you around um, the problem you're having um, with, with the existing radar. But it's obviously, this is a somewhat more expensive solution than Travis because you've actually got to put something, um, you've got to put an additional radar um, in. Reoptimization is something we've actually already done. The, the radars are actually tuned periodically every couple of years as it is. Um, and basically what they did is, is a team went out and they, they retuned, they, they tuned the radar to its, its, its best possible um, settings to account for the fact that the, all these turbines were in the area and it built a, it gave us a little bit more wiggle room in terms of uh, having more turbines in the area. And then uh, still another, another potential solution is infill radars. Now gap, gap filler radars are basically designed to fill in like pie wedges of, in, from another area. Infill radars, you'd actually have the radar in the field of the wind turbines and they're high frequency radars. So they actually fill in the gap that's above the wind turbine field. So as I said before, with a clutter map, you're actually zeroing out particular areas where the, you're, being, you're being made you're making the radar blind in particular areas. If, but if you combine that with an infill radar, you can actually get that piece back. Um, and, but then you'd have to build that along with the, the sensor fusion, which I discussed earlier, so that you can, you can build this piece in with what you're already getting from the radar to get a complete picture. So these are not mutually exclusive. It's kind of one builds on, the next builds on the next. Midterm, more midterm fixes. In midterm, we're looking at three to five years. Um, and let me just say before I leave the short term solutions, we're actually, we've been working with the Department of Energy um, for some time on a joint research effort. It's already funded, um, at least for this fiscal year. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some of these potential solutions and we're going to go out and we're going to field test them over the next year so that we can then go to industry and yes, this, this, and this are validated systems and we can now work with you to put those in place. 
the midterm fixes, one of the one of the things we can do is hardware and software modifications. Now, I, I did talk about the, the clutter map solution, but the clutter map solution is basically a, a fairly quick add-on to the existing system. This would involve actually going in and altering, um, for instance, the software of an existing system in a more complex way. Um, phased array radars are a very promising solution set. The radars we've got right now are either, uh, basically they're fan beam radars. So. You basically, you get a um, from the ground up into the up into the atmosphere. You get a a view, and if and if that beam hits a turbine near ground level, it zeroes everything out all up into the atmosphere. So a phased array radar actually shoots out multiple beams, so that if if some of the lower beams hit a turbine, the the higher beams are not necessarily knocked out by that, and the radar does not lose its picture. So, um, and there are systems that are already out there that are phased array radars. We have been approached more than once by some of the manufacturers, but we are not going to work directly with any single manufacturer. So we are going to run, uh, this is all part of the testing that we're going to be doing with the Department of Energy um, on some of these systems. It's in midterm fix, however, because these systems also tend to be fairly expensive. These systems are probably going to be $25 million to $30 million a piece by the time you're done with buying the system and installing the system. Um, hence, it's here rather than short run solution. And then on the infill gap fill, uh, on the infill radars, which I discussed earlier, there are also uh, there are possible improvements you can make make to those. Right now, we're looking at commercial off-the-shelf systems, and it's going to, it's probably going to be possible to do further design in these to, to better fill in the gaps. Then the longer-term fixes, they're listed here, they're in the report. Frankly, we've got our hands full just with the short-run and mid-term fixes, and we're not going to be doing a whole lot of work on this anytime um, soon. And I already dealt with sensor fusion and most of this um, <coughs> stuff. I guess from this slide, I'll just let you know, it's not just the Defense Department that is having a problem um, with renewable energy and conflicts between renewable energy and radars. The, the, the National Weather Service has also got a major problem. And in fact, um, if you're in the right area of the country, you, you will see maps where it would appear you have a perpetual thunderstorm. And it's not a perpetual thunderstorm, it's a wind farm complex. So they're, they're going through the same thing we're going through, and again, it's an unintended consequence of uh, renewable energy development. And I'll also say there's, a, there's also another system coming on the SLEP program, Service Life Extension Program, where we're hopeful with, it, with an already existing program, it'll probably improve our ability um, to um, to see what's out there, even without some of uh, some of the R and D that we're working on right now, but again, we're going to have to validate that because the systems, while the systems are going to improve our view, the system was not specifically designed to do that. And this is probably, maybe even though it was an excruciating detail, maybe more detail than you already wanted. And, and I'm, I'd be happy to take any questions on. Yes. So do you have a DSHS model or maybe you just had two of them? Um, could any of those uh, address migratory bird, bird issues or cumulative impacts from the civilization of the Soviet Well, and that's a, you know, frankly, this is one of the things that the White House group is trying to do. Because obviously, the clearinghouse is designed to, to concern itself with military impacts. The, DA, the DHS tool is is specifically designed to worry about what DHS is worried about, which is their long-range surveillance radars. Um, the migratory, the migratory bird issue obviously fits into the into the more the NEPA things you've got to got to consider. And the White House group is trying to take all of these disparate pieces that, that fit into the into into permitting and come up with a one-stop shop basically for developers. So ultimately you'd have a checklist of all the things you have to deal with in one place and, and an overall solution set forth. So 
So we're participating, you know, in that group, but but DO, DOD, our, our primary focus is not, you know, the avian issue, the, the birds, the bats, um, all of those issues. That's primarily DOI, and DOI had a FACA, I know, that was looking at that, but I don't know um, what DOD, what, what DOI is doing in terms of, of R&D to um, look at that. Well, back well, to you. Well, the rest of this is, uh, is your time. We, that's all the PowerPoint we're going to inflict on you. Um, uh, definitely the two folks at the ends of this table who have spent a lot of time around the Department of Defense. We've got our, you know, 5,000 hour PowerPoint patch. Don't know if uh, our good um, county and uh, our, our county legislators have um, have quite as much PowerPoint, but uh, we'll sit here for a couple of minutes with of pregnant pause and I'll leave or, I mean, have, have we scratched your itch? Have we let you guys know what you need to know about how we're tying, trying to tie uh, all of these analyses of the mission compatibility of renewable energy with you know, you know, national level through the clearinghouse all the way down to uh, city and county level. Comments, questions, concerns? Sir. was kind of, <clears throat> I spoke last week at the Association of Defense Communities conference in, in Norfolk, and it was it was more about the JLUS and the partner build, building uh, in that context last week as well. So. That really is kind of a mindset shift for lots of us because, you know, I, I'm on a campaign, and this is based on my time at Nellis, um, to stamp out use of the E-word uh, because when people outside our lives hear that they're encroaching on us, it doesn't do a very good job for building that partnership kind of capacity. And words do matter in, in setting that foundation. So if we stop talking about encroachment management plans and talk more about compatible use plans or compatible development, compatible growth, um, we're probably going to get somewhere. I finally had... Uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretaries of both um, Air Force and Army say, you know, that might be a good thing for us uh, to do to kind of keep reorienting. And you know, that's why the early consultation is so good because rather than get the military stop, we figure out a way that works for all of us before um, you know, anybody gets surprised. So. Well, I know, um, and I, I tell folks that you know, ICEMAP, what a cute little acronym. No, let's let's get rid of it. What I have to do is convince my boss to rewrite um, you know, the I and E instruction and have it called compatible. You know, pick something. Uh, once the DoD, uh, once the DoD documentation no longer refers to encroachment but refers to you know, compatible use and partnerships then the other stuff can start rolling downhill. But right now, there are tons of contractors who've been running around doing little sales jobs on how they can write your ice map for you. So uh, yeah, that was installation, uh, 
something encroachment management action plan. I forget what the, the C was, and I had to chuckle when that one came across my desk. But. What you can't say is we would object to that. You have absolutely no authority to hint to someone that that would be an objection because that authority has been explicitly taken away. You can say until the cows come home, it would work a heck of a lot better over here, or there's this you know, design for a vertical, vertical egg beater turbine or a couple other things that would work a lot better for us. So you can lay out everything that would be better and say, can you please do an economic analysis and see if your project is viable in that way? Um, and we really do need to um, make sure that we're talking uh, uh, because, and this, we haven't figured this part out because it's only two weeks old. I mean, two weeks ago today, the Secretary of Defi uh, Defense delegated um, the authority in writing for, um, you know, for my boss to be in charge of pulling this whole thing together, and the law clearly says to ensure a coordinated department position. So we have to be able to coordinate all the way down and all the way up. I'm intensely comfortable with people like you saying, man, this is a lot better, this is a lot better, this is a lot better, but we have to have something built in that once the hair on the back of your neck goes up that we might not get there, then the, the communication needs to start to figure out is this no kidding, a risk of mission failure? You know, at, at Bill's and my level, we tend to think in terms of unacceptable risk of mission failure because it's not up to us to determine that risk to national security. But once we determine that there's a probable risk of mission failure or a uh, possible and unacceptable risk of mission failure, then we've got to start figuring out how to inform those very high level um, political appointees that, okay, mission failure here, can we live with it? You know, is mission failure to uh, limit the use of an MTR? Maybe we can live with it. Is mission failure to limit the runway ops at one of the busiest uh, fighter bases in the country? Probably not. Um, so. Uh, well, absolutely. Again, I mean, if uh, that – let us know what's going on. Again, I mean, it is delegated in writing that we must – and delegated in writing and part of federal law that we must ensure a coordinated Department of Defense position. And if the Department of, posi uh, Department of Defense position is these guys figured out how to do it and live together, touchdown. So um, – yeah, Can exactly. Can I offer them to step outside the fence? Because the actual regulatory authority is outside the fence. It's in, in John's hands, it's in my hands, and in our counterparts. So don't be afraid to seek out your local governmental officials who actually have the leverage. Well, there's also an impact of stuff out of the county. Some of the local guys have to leave the state. Yeah, and, it, and that, I know that surprises a lot of folks, but that, that really represents a large chunk of the United of cities there isn't the permitting process that's available and nobody cared until all of a sudden here's a way to make a lot of money doing almost nothing on my land and you know old fighter pilots and helo pilots go but wait we love flying low there yeah so it, it's a, a tough nut for us to crack can i just i just want to say something too on the, the the reason congress put the language they put in there terms of they, they wanted a single voice within DOD speaking for the department because developers were getting different decisions depending on which base they went to and in fact even depending on which commander was commanding at the base so you would have a developer that was told no and then the commander would change to the next developer would be told yes and so we need to come up with a some kind of consistent decision-making process um, 
But if you have already found a way to get to yes. Then we need to, because what we're, we also need to export best practices. So that's why it's just critical that we know what's going on. Yep, you got a uh, retired installation commander doing his damnedest to make sure that doesn't happen. So. Are these slides available also? I'm, I'm pretty sure they are. I think every slide deck is going to be available through the, uh, the conference website. And if you need, um, I mean, send me an email and I can zap them as well. So. All right. Oh. Just tell us what and where you're doing it. Uh, well, the, we're, we're tied to the Deputy Assistant Secretaries for Energy for all of the services. I mean, Bill and I see uh, Tom Hicks, Kevin Geis, and um, Richard Kidd, who have the service oversight for that all the time. So they will know if, if we are getting close to something on an EUL or a power purchase agreement um, that they just need to throw it over the fence and say, take a look at this. And if it's a PV array or a trough, you have about 100 out of 100 chance that we're going to say, cool. Um, the, uh, again, the, the things that tend to, uh, you know, tend to scare us are um, high radar reflectivity and, uh, and or IR reflectivity, molten salt. Uh, anecdotally, it's probably 90% wind, 5% solar towers, and 5% transmission projects that Bill and I have been dealing with for the last year. Um, so if you're looking to put a PV array, uh, we need to know about it, and that's about it because the answer is going to come back pretty quickly. Go forth and do wonderful things. According, according to the law, I'm supposed to assess utility scale, renewable energy um, for mission compatibility. Anywhere. So anywhere in the United States of America. Well, the either someone has done the voluntary early portion at the base level, and it's filtered up, and if this is a... You're, you're absolutely right. Now, but again, um, we have access. If it's, if it's not going to tip the FAA scale at 200 feet, it's probably not going to be an issue. So... Uh, I have access to OE AAA. So solar towers, I will find out about. Um, and that's really what I care about. If I can't be held accountable for something that none of us have a way of knowing. Now, the major parts of the industry, you know, NextEra and um, RES Americas, Iberdrola, I mean, they're all wind and solar, and they, at an industry level, know about us. And the concentrating solar industry, uh, Bright Source Solar Reserve, Abengoa, 
they all know about us. So they're coming to us directly in Washington. Um, Nope, nope. The, this is all about DOD not being able to block stuff that it shouldn't block. You know, the, the reason, you know, one of the reasons that there are such restrictions in the law is because we really did kind of cry wolf at a lot of places. Um, and that's because installation commanders not only don't have teams that can really do a thoughtful analysis of a lot of this, they don't had, or until the law came out, they didn't have any incentive to really look for it. If you're hoping to get your star, um, you're not going to want to be the guy or gal who gave away something that, you know, the next person comes along and says, oh, my gosh, how did you let them do that? So the safe play, and, you know, Joe had talked about how it was impossible to get comments out of the folks on the base. The safe play for the installation commander was always, gosh, that kind of makes me nervous, or gosh, you know, I, I might have to change a couple of my flight routes, or uh, no, please don't put that there. And until the law came out to hold our feet to the fire, um, once we had told the FAA, hey, we don't think we like it, if they agreed that it could be a possible hazard, they'd put out the notice of presumed hazard, and then 100% of the onus was on the developer to come to the FAA and to DOD and prove that it wasn't. And so that's why some of these things languished for three or four years because, um, you know, the developer really didn't know how to start at trying to prove uh, that the wing commander's gut feel that that might be bad was wrong. Um, and so now that's been flipped 180 out. The onus of proof is now on us to prove that it is a problem before we ask for the determination of hazard, so. And I will be the first to admit, and I have told uh, the um, House and Senate Armed Committee staffers who wrote the thing that I think the pendulum swung too far in the other direction. And uh, you know, this is our season to create legislative proposals that go through an excruciating Pentagon process and then go over to House and Senate Armed Service Committee staff. And I have made a couple of proposals that have gotten, you know, all the way up coordinated for us to be able to ask them to leave the, the Pentagon to kind of bring the pendulum back. And that's to ensure we have the uh, capability to protect training and test assets that we don't have in, um, we don't have a vehicle, a federal vehicle to protect. Now, our County and uh, state partners do, and um, what I would envision, something that is so tough that it's going to um, make a mission fail, a training or a testing mission fail, that we can't get the FAA because of their statutory language. If we've been through our process, I could see a situation where a base commander has a letter signed by a deputy cabinet secretary saying we believe that this would present an unacceptable risk. That base commander, armed with that, goes to the county commission, says, may I read this into the record? I'm going to guess that it would be a pretty easy vote for the, uh, the commissioners. So that's the, you know, people have asked me, and you're kind of getting along the line, what do we do about something that we know is really, really bad, but, um, you know, the FAA can't cover us? That's how I would play it, is uh, go through our process so we have the total, you know, the, the law is damn insistent that it's a coordinated Department of Defense position, but the person with the right relationship and the best way to, you know, make it stick is to walk in, <coughs> I've got this. Um, we actually at Nellis, uh, to defeat the um, third turn condominiums, um, had to have had to have two four stars come and testify uh, in Clark County. So, and we evidently are the only people who Bruton Smith, the owner of the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, Lowe's Motor Speedway, and Homestead Motor Speedway, were evidently the only people that have ever beaten him in his zoning fight. And it took uh, the commander of Air Combat Command and the chief of staff of the Air Force to do it. So. And, and that actually raises concerns that, that I've got with this new standard because if you know as a, as a local commissioner who's very committed to your military mission um, I personally don't need something from the secretary you know if 
base commander tells me that he's got an issue, that's good enough for me. But with the new requirement level, now I'm, I'm concerned about whether the base commander, even if he really thought it was a problem, uh, he's really not, he's not gonna be free to make that kind of a public statement now. So, <coughs> although, I mean, it's kind of funny because when we first started this, we went from the, the private emails, don't quote me on Gmail, and now we've got a good open public dialogue my concern about where the bar is set now is that it's going to drive us back the other way, which still works for me, but it just it's just kind of ironic because we've locally developed a system that works extremely well, uh, but the new law basically is going to be telling my base commanders and deputy commanders, uh, you can't send that letter anymore. Well, it's uh, going to say you can't object, just as we were talking, right. you can say this works, this works, this works, this works, and this works. And if you can't get there, then he does have to say, Mother, may I, before uh, before putting in the objection. Yeah, so I, I, like I said, I, I expect to still get the communication from the unofficial side. Uh, and so that, you know, that's gonna be important to me. But at some point, we will find ourselves, I have no doubt, in a situation where legally we're challenged as what we've done because DOD officially said this was okay, so on what basis are you that legal challenge will come. Um, I know it will. I happen to have the advantage that my chief civil attorney is a former Air Force JAG officer. So um, I'm going to have to have Brian craft some new language in our uh, uh, ex in our findings of fact that will allow us to exercise discretion uh, based upon our views of military issues or something. We'll work through it. I mean, but I do. I don't think what Dave is doing. Uh, I think this is excellent because it's going to trap a lot of other things that we're not trapping now in the counties that don't have zoning. Um, but like I said before, we're definitely going to have to adjust how we do things internally to mesh well with what he's doing. And we've already had the, the conversation between ourselves of making sure that we keep each other informed of anything I hear about that he hears, you know, that he gets and vice versa so that we're always on the same page. So uh, it, it's going to be a new layer, new layer of communications we've got to get yep. functioning. But those are the people who, according to the Constitution, have that responsibility to make sure you know, we can live with it here, we can't live with it there. And that's, you know, that's what was lacking was, all right, we don't have to say no wind turbines within 50 miles of every base in the country. You know, that, that would be false. And people at a base level, for all the right human reasons, tend to think that you know what we're doing here, man. This is it. Um, there has to be someone who looks at the outside and said, "Well, I can live with a little degradation there. I can't live with it there." And the person at the base level is not the right one to make that decision. And ultimately, because the law dictated so, that person who's going to make that decision is number two in the entire department, and will have involved already service secretaries and uh, you know, major figures. Um, and that was because, again, we cried wolf. We had far too many people where the local guy or gal said, this is tough. And the fact that you know, the, the backlog was not just stuff that was hanging out. The backlog were the 249 projects that we had said no to. And when we took a hard look at them with a tougher standard, Right off the bat, no, 229 of the 249, you know, 92% uh, we we would not have needed to object to, but but we had.
having being in the the group that uh, sees all the BRAC documents, a um, couple of people try to make that, but it's it, it's uh, not realistic that the kind of things that would happen from a few wind turbines would lead to a BRAC action. Yeah, which is. Probably a good example is, is what we've done in Cascade County, and, and I have caught a fair amount of flack over it. Um, our runway, we have, we have a, a beautiful 11,500 foot long runway to Malmstrom that's inactive because of BRAC. But our zoning still recognizes the clear zones and the APZs because I'm not willing to surrender that asset uh, that may be needed in the future. So, you know, whenever I talk with my friends at DOD, I, I tell them, I said, I know that there's no mission pending. I, you know, I'm not, not here beating on the door for another mission. If you happen to have one, I'd love it. But, uh, but we continue to protect that, and we included it in our J lease. Uh, and that's a decision the local government can make, but it is not without its political ramifications because we do have developers coming and saying, by congressional action, that runway doesn't exist anymore. How dare you still constrain land based upon it? But we continue to do so, and we believe we have strong enough legal foundation to do so. Um, I wish I could guarantee that future commissions will continue to do that. I know as long as I'm on the commission, we're, I'm going to still be pushing to do it. But that's kind of the nature of the beast. And, and um, we view it as anything that that occurs at that base, the reduction in missiles, the, the, uh, if we do something that disrupts the potential future of that runway, all of those things could bite us as a community in the next BRAC round. Or it could be an F to you in the future, should another requirement arise, <coughs> they've already got that, that runway in place. And, and that's, expensive. that's the way I view it. I mean, with, with all of the, the E-word stuff going on elsewhere, and the lack of available airspace, I'm sitting up there with a, a totally uh, unconflicted runway, APZs, clear zones. I got the Hayes Moa and two Atkas north of me that are the size of the panhandle of, of uh, Florida. And I keep saying to myself as these, these newer technology aircraft come out with the, the further seeing radar, um, someday the Air Force may need that airspace and they may need that runway and I'm gonna try to keep them available for or the Navy, or anybody else wants to use that right now. That'd be great. Call it Montana flag. We took a close look at using DOE's loan guarantee program as a way of feeding us info, and we found there are actually so few that go through the DOE loan guarantee program because it is so excruciatingly difficult for them to get all the sign-offs, et cetera, that it was not a, a viable, um, not really a viable route for us to go. One of Bill's closest uh, contacts, um, is the guy who one runs the uh, radar program in DOE's wind and water um, directorate. So we are plugged in to the same group of folks over there um, and they're trying to help us solve the technology so that we never get to this cumulative impact issue. And I've seen some pretty fascinating things that have already been ops checked in Europe because there's obviously a lot more wind and a lot more congestion. Um, and what, I, what Bill and I have to do is get the comptroller to give us that account and process by which we can take the check. I'm looking for a, a press the test somewhere. 
twenty thousand bucks to do a radar reoptimization or something, just so we can pull the money in, um, because I really believe having having proved that this is an issue, the physicists, the radar engineers, and um, the entrepreneurs see it as an opportunity. So most of this will get fixed. Yeah, we, we looked at it not even from the perspective of just getting the information, but also what if we cut the money off with that stop project? And as Dave said, there aren't enough projects that are relying on it for it to really work. You could possibly go after the production tax credit, but you know, that runs counter to the entire concept of trying to <coughs> encourage renewable energy. And our process is designed to try to get as many projects forward as possible, meet the national goals, and still preserve our needs. So that's the best way to go. The picture of me, the president, and Harry Reid with my left arm going up like this, I am pointing north right over the mountains on the north edge of the Las Vegas Valley um, and talking about that phenomenal national security resource that is the Nevada Test and Training Range. I said, Mr. President, we get it. Energy independence is a facet of national security just as military readiness is. And right here, we are trying to get the balance and the sighting exactly right. And he said, that that's it. That is exactly what we want to be here and is put the right thing in the right place so that we have both an energy independent and a secure future. Um, so it's a little bit Solomonic at times to try to figure out, you know, and obviously Crescent Dunes was not five, not 20, 35 we can live with. And we established the precedent. And I mean, we had to go to, uh, there is a vault underneath the Congressional Visitor Center. Um, and so we had to go give Reed and his staff a briefing that had been dumbed down to secret level. And he needed to, you know, look, it was the, the most articulate radar engineer PhD I could have imagined. I mean, this guy made, you know, a history major fighter pilot understand what was going on with radar propagation. Um, but Reed himself had to be satisfied that this was careful analysis and not a DOD, we don't want to deal with it, because he had perceived a few of those over the years and had been trying, you know. So we've now got to be able to go out with fact and data and show our analysis. Some of the places will say, here's the science. We can't tell you why we have set this as a parameter, but here's the science to prove that that is the parameter, um, because for far too long, we didn't. And and it's not just Senator Reid. I mean, Senator Merkley from um, Oregon is also pretty savvy. So we've had to be able to show that we've got good science in developing. We're developing even more good science. All right. Anybody ready to say, Uncle? I'll give you five minutes back. Thank you again for hanging in. Let me thank uh, Joe um, or John, who's gone. Thank uh, Commissioner Joe Briggs for coming and hanging for the entire week so we could do these bookends. Um, Phil had to, just like I did. <laughs> but uh, at least we spent an entire week not inside the Puzzle Pals. So thank you guys for bringing us out of our little cages. And thanks for hanging out so long. Travel safe back home.